If you have a Bible, take it and turn to the book of Mark. We are back in Mark in a series which we started uh, in um, last Easter, really. And we were in Mark chapter 8. Uh, it's really a turning point in the book. A, a turning point and, and the center of the book. The center of the book, not simply because there are 16 chapters in, the Mar- in Mark and we're in the middle of the 8th chapter, But it is a turning point because because really there's been this driving question. A question that has uh, filled the pages of this book, haunted the pages up until this point. And the question, it comes to a head right there in verse 27 of chapter 8. Jesus asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? Who is Jesus? That's the question that Mark has been getting us to focus on for the last eight chapters. Who is Jesus? And I would suggest to you that it's a question not just for that day, but for this day. In fact, it's probably a more important question for our day than for that day because uh, our world has been so affected by Jesus. Whether you're a Christian or not, this question involves your critical investigation. I mean, this question, um, it demands your critical investigation, especially if you're a Christian. Especially if you're a Christian. You need to ask the question, who is Jesus? Uh, just think of it like this. I mean, even if you're not a Christian here today, let, just think of the, some of the names of your best friends. John, Mark, Mary, Luke. Where did these names come from? Well, it's because Jesus had followers, and these were their names. Or, or let's, just take, um, let's just take your calendar, for instance. The months, January, February, sure, those are from Roman gods. But the year, 2018, what's that about? Well, it's because no matter how, no matter how you, you uh, determine it, whether you say, call it CE or AD or whatever, the reality is, is that the turning point of history has to do with Jesus of Nazareth. Or let's just think about a map. Um, we live in Santa Barbara because in the third century there was a follower of Jesus, a Christian named Barbara. But think about the capital of our great state. Sacramento, because Jesus had a meal, a sacrament. You can't even look at a map without seeing Jesus' influence all over it. You can't talk to your friends without seeing Jesus' influence all over it. You can't read any, any good piece of literature from history or from today without seeing Jesus' influence all over it. Uh, I just finished um, Patty Smith's Just Kids. It's a uh, national, uh, national book of the year um, in 2010 like, or 11. She's the famous punk rocker, right, who uh, sang Because the Night Belongs to Lovers. And it's about the beginning of uh, her kind of life in New York. The whole thing, all the dates are marked by saints days and the church calendar and she's continually referring to bible verses and there's no sense that you get that she's uh, a follower of jesus or a christian but christ haunts the book you see the world in which you live in whether you like it or not is a world that has been completely influenced by jesus christ and i would say no one has influenced it more H.G. Wells, who was himself not a Christian, once wrote, The historian simply cannot portray the progress of humanity honestly without giving a foremost place to the penniless preacher of Nazareth. Though he left no impress on the historical record of his time, more than 1900 years later, a a historian like myself, who doesn't even call himself a Christian, finds the picture centering irresistibly around the life and character of this man. In other words, what H.G. Wells, not a Christian, is saying is you cannot make sense of history without actually considering Jesus. 
Well, there's been many answers given to this question over the years. Some say that Jesus was an apocalyptic figure who preached the end of the world and was telling people to repent and escape the wrath to come. Other people say, no, 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 no. Jesus wasn't like that at all. Jesus was simply a sage, a traveling wisdom teacher who told people how to live in the world and make sense of the world around them. People in his own day were answering this question. Verse 27, Peter answers, well, some people say you're John the Baptist, brought back from the dead, that is. Others people say you're Elijah or one of the prophets. Of course, not everyone was so positive about Jesus. Some people thought he was an insurrectionist, a traitor, come up to overthrow the Roman government. That's why they crucified him. It's an important question. Many questions, many answers have been given, but here's, here's the thing about this question. It can't remain academic. It's not just about what's the history of ideas about who is Jesus. See, this question is a question that each and every one of us must answer, which is why Jesus does not let his disciples remain academic. Look at verse 29. Jesus turns to Peter, but who do you say that I am? And it's emphatic. And whatever answer you give, it's self-involving. Self-involving means that when you answer that question, you are staking a claim about your belief and your relationship to Jesus, to Christianity, to the world. And not one of us can escape it. See, every one of us, no one can remain neutral. This passage brings us to a crossroads. Who do you, emphatically, you say that I am? And you have to answer the question. To remain neutral is to take a side. And so as we look at the question, as we answer the question, let's turn to God in prayer. God, as we come to this crucial point in the book of Mark, reveal to us Jesus. That we might see him for who he is who he really is. Some of us doubt his existence. Some of us doubt his love for us. Some of us doubt his relevance in our lives. Others of us simply don't like it. Some of us here are longing to know you deeper, but confused. Some of us here have come to see that Jesus is their greatest treasure. And they ache and they long for him but they don't have enough of them. Wherever we find ourselves today, give us Jesus. He's the one we need. And only you can do that. So we pray these things in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, Jesus turns and he asks Peter, who do you say that I am? And Peter answers, verse 29, you are the Christ. You are the Christ. Now, that doesn't mean much to us. We usually think of Christ as Jesus' last name. But Christ was not a last name. Uh, Jesus was a first name, and lots of people had the name Jesus, actually, in the ancient world. Did you know that? There wasn't just one Jesus. There were tons of Jesus. But there was only one Christ, because Christ was an honorific, a title. You see, Peter belonged to a group of people called the Jews. And the Jews, or the Judeans, had been persecuted for... Hundreds of years. For hundreds of years, they had not lived in their own land and ruled themselves in their own land. First, it was the Babylonians who ruled over them. And then it was the Greeks and the Seleucids and the Ptolemies and then the Romans. Now the Romans rule over them. And they were oppressed. They were an oppressed people by an oppressive foreign government. And they knew that things weren't right with the world because... Not only were they were oppressed, they believed, because their scriptures told them that the reason that they were oppressed is because, because there was a riff in their relationship with God. And that God had given them over to punishment. But they had hope. 
One day, Sunday, God was going to send this figure called the Christ or anointed one. It means anointed one, that's what people say. And of course, that is its semantic uh, derivative. But that's not its significance. See, the significance of the Christ was this. The Jews believed that one day, someday, God was going to send someone. And through that person, he was going to restore the fortunes of Israel. That he was going to defeat Israel's enemies. That he was going to bring about justice and righteousness and peace and universal flourishing. Not just for the Jews, but for the world. Like every person would flourish in their job. Every person would flourish in government. Every society would flourish as a community. There would no, be no more rifts between people. In fact, even creation itself, the people's relationship with the environment would flourish. Hostility would completely end. And it would all come through this man. In other words, when Peter says you are the Christ, what he is basically saying is, you're it. You're the answer. You're the one who fulfills all our deepest hopes and greatest desires. You are it. It was all pinned on Jesus. It was the mid-90s, and they kept coming out with new technologies to put in your home entertainment system. First, there was the big screen TV, and then you had to get the cable box next to it. And then after the cable box, you had to get the surround sound. And then after the surround sound, you know, then you had to, um, you had to figure out uh, how the DVD thing worked. And there was the DVD and the VCR, and then there was like all the game contraptions like Nintendo and PlayStation and all the rest. And you know what came with all these things? Lots of controllers. You ever done You go to someone's house and you sit down and there's just like 10 controllers. And you're like, what do I do with all this? I remember sitting with someone one time and they said, you know, it would be awesome. This is after we got like, you know, two hours of trying to figure out which power button do you push at what time to get the thing on. And you finally get it on after you've called the self-help desk or called the help desk and done all these other things. And then, of course, you're like, the lights are on and the movie's starting. Ugh. But you can't press pause because if you press pause, you might mess it all up, Right? And at some point, um, someone says, I'm sitting in this room, and someone says, I wish they just had, like, a remote that would do all of it. And, and someone else says, you know they have those, right? It's called a universal remote, right? This is old news to us. We use our smartphones for this thing. But universal remote, it was amazing, because it was like... All these things that we needed worked out, all these desires that we had that we needed fulfilled, they all could like actually coalesce in this one controller. Well, basically what I'm saying is that for the Jews, Jesus was a universal remote. Because in the same way, in the same way that a universal remote brings all these, all these needs together into one package, this one thing, so Jesus, Jesus is the one who fulfills all our hopes and all our desires. And it's not just for the Jews, it's for you and me as well. It's for you and me as well. You see, let's be honest. Most of us feel some sort of dissatisfaction in life and in many aspects of life. We feel dissatisfaction at work. We feel dissatisfaction in our relationships. We feel dissatisfaction in our marriages. We feel dissatisfaction with our health. We feel dissatisfaction with our community. We feel dissatisfaction with the weather. That's why we're always talking about it. Even here, even in sunny Santa Barbara. You know, it'd be great if it was just two degrees warmer. And there was like three clouds in the sky instead of no clouds. Right? Even here. But deep down, all these longings, all these desires, they're pointing to a greater desire that only he can fulfill. That only he can fulfill. That's what Peter is saying. But we look to all these other places to fulfill that desire, even places where we know we can't get them f fulfilled. You've, you've, heard, um, you've heard of Jim Gaffigan, the comedian,
Jim Gaffigan has this great bit on McDonald's, you know, how like you never say hi to a friend in McDonald's because you're like, I don't know, I'm, I'm just checking out the ATM or whatever. But we all go to McDonald's at this point because he's like, look, they're selling one billion ham or six billion hamburgers a day. They're only, the population of America is only this big. Do the math, right? We're eating McDonald's, but we're not telling anybody about it, right? And then he's like, and we love it. We love the fries. We love the burger. And he's like, and it feels so good going down. He's like, but you know, in the commercials, they never videotape people five minutes after, right? <laughs> See their faces and their feeling and all that. It's like, feels so good, good going down, but, but not after. And then in that bit, Jim Gaffigan turns, he says, but let's be honest. He goes, maybe you don't go to McDonald's. And he starts riffing on those people like me who don't go to McDonald's and are kind of snobby about it, right? Uh, except for, I had a daddy-daughter weekend this weekend. It was just me and Neve without Pam. <laughs> yep, we went to McDonald's. <laughs> We're watching this thing as I'm preparing for my sermon, and he's like, ooh, McDonald's is good. I'm like, honey, you, need, you don't know that. You don't, you know, she's like, no, we went. I'm like, shh. <laughs> but then Gaffigan turns and he says this. He goes, look, you have your McDonald's too. We all have our McDonald's. Your McDonald's is just us weekly. He's like, and it feels so good going down. Or your McDonald's is, you know, and he starts naming these various things that we do that we look to to satisfy ourselves, but they don't satisfy. All these different places that we turn. Uh, your McDonald's, my McDonald's, unfortunately, is my smartphone. What's yours? What's the place where you look to, where you're looking to get your deepest hopes and longing satisfied? You know that it won't. Deep down, what are you looking for in all these things? You're looking for Jesus. That's who you're looking for. In the good things in life and in the bad things in life. And the things that will satisfy you to some extent and the things that won't really satisfy you at all. Uh, T.K. Chesterton once said, every man banging on the door of a brothel is looking for God. And he was on to something. It's why we get taken up with stories. One time, C.S. Lewis was talking to his friend, J.R. Tolkien, and he said, myths were lies, and therefore worthless, even though they breathe through silver. Tolkien was saying, like, these stories that we study in the ancient stories, they're pipe dreams. They make us feel good, but they're pipe dreams. And Tolkien looked at him and he said, no, 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 no. Absolutely not. It's what Tolkien then conveyed to Lewis was that that the best way, sometimes the only way to convey the deeper truths of the world are through stories. Actually, this comes out in that book, When Breath Becomes Air, that I was talking about earlier. That, that the deepest questions in life, they aren't brought about through analytic philosophy or through studying neurons and chemicals, but through stories. Stories point beyond themselves to something deeper. And the reason why we love stories is because we are looking, hoping, made to have the satisfaction that we read about in the stories. See, we're all, to some degree or another, little wooden boys who don't feel quite human and long to be fully human and flourish. We are, we are all sleeping beauties who long to be woken up from a dream and be kissed and have love, love eternal. We, we all long for that mentor, the um, Coach Taylor, Friday nights out. Friday Night's Lights, sorry. Coach Taylor, 
who will who sees potential in us, a potential maybe that that isn't even latent in us, but he can bring us to a place of flourishing that we could never reach ourselves because he believed in us and he loved us. What are we looking for in all these figures? All these coaches, all these mentors, all these lovers, all these fathers, what are we looking for? We're looking for Jesus. They're all about him. Deep down, they're all about him. You see, he is the one who fulfills your greatest hopes and your deepest desires. It's all about him. And that's what Peter was confessing when he said, you are the Christ. But in order to bring these things about, he has to suffer and die. You'll notice in verse 31 that after Peter says this, Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. Jesus didn't say that he will suffer, notice. He says that he must suffer. It's a necessity. In other words, Jesus' death was not some tragic accident of history. That his death was actually planned. That it was in the cards from the beginning. And that it had to happen. Why? Because this is completely counterintuitive. Uh, The Christ was supposed to be a winner, not a loser. The Christ was supposed to live, not die. The Christ was supposed to bring life, not death. The Christ was supposed to crush the enemies, not be crushed by the enemies. What's going on here? This is completely counterintuitive. That's why Peter is dumbfounded and he rebukes Jesus in verse 32. Never! Why was this necessary? Well, the answer comes two chapters later. When Jesus teaches these things again to his disciples, and in Mark 10, 45, he says that he did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. A ransom. It comes from the metaphor of slavery. If one is in bondage, a ransom gets them out of bondage. It's a price that has to be paid to deliver someone, to release someone. And you see... What Mark is saying is, look, humanity is enslaved. We have been reading through the book of Mark and studying it, and one of the things that we have seen on every other page is that humanity is enslaved. They're enslaved to the demons, they're enslaved to Satan, and they're enslaved to their own hard, sinful hearts. And there is no amount of willpower that will get them out of it. The only thing that will get them out of it is deliverance. They need someone to break through and rescue them. They need a ransom to be paid, a sacrifice to be made, a sacrifice so that they could be set free. And it's completely counterintuitive until you know the predicament. When I was... um, when I was a little boy, I played basketball for a, um, a school league. And, uh, and my team, we won the championship like two out of three years that I played because we were awesome. And the reason we were awesome is because we had one player that was awesome. <laughs> he was amazing. That's why we only won two years out of three. He graduated one year and moved on. His name was Joey Collins. Joey was amazing. And uh, he scored like, you know, out of our our 30-point games or whatever, our 26-point games, he scored like 22 or 24 of the points, right? And uh, there was this one game, we were in the championship, and uh, it was on the wire. So under 10 seconds left, we're down three points. And Joey's on the free throw line. And uh, and I'm sitting there watching, because that's all I did during the games. (laughs) because that was awesome. (laughs) And I'm watching Joey, and I'm like, we got this. We're down, but Joey's on the line. And uh, and he makes the first free throw, because of course, that's what he does. He wins. He makes free throws. 
And then the second free throw goes up. And he missed. Like, bad missed. Like, this is the worst miss I've ever seen Joey Collins ever do in my whole life. And I'm sitting there thinking, this is Joey Collins. What's he doing? He's not supposed to lose. He's supposed to win. He's not supposed to miss. He's supposed to make. What is going on? And as soon as I asked the question, the question was answered. As the ball banged off the front of the rim, and he caught his own rebound and then scored. He sacrificed his shot. He sacrificed his shooting percentage, his free throw percentage. He sacrificed so that we could win the game. And it was necessary because of how far we were down. You see, if we were only down one, he could have made both. If we were only down one, it didn't require sacrifice. But we were down more than one. We were down two, and there was 10 seconds left. And so in order to win the game, he had to sacrifice. And he did. What Peter doesn't understand is how far down he is. What Peter doesn't understand is that a sacrifice is necessary to win. What Peter understand, doesn't understand is that in order to save his life, the Messiah must lose his own. See, why couldn't Peter comprehend that the Christ had to die? Well, it's not just that Peter didn't understand Jesus. Peter didn't understand himself. Peter didn't understand, he couldn't comprehend that Jesus had to die for the simple reason that Peter couldn't comprehend that he was one who needed someone to die for him. And do we? Do we? See, when Peter says you are the Christ, he's saying, Jesus, you're the answer to my question. But Peter's question was, how do we get the Romans out? How do we flourish? And what Jesus is saying, I am the answer to your question. But the question goes deeper than you think, and you're asking the wrong one. The question you should be asked is, how do I become liberated from sin and Satan? And the answer to that is, the Messiah must give his life. See, Peter is using Jesus to fulfill his own agenda. And Jesus is saying, I have a bigger agenda. And that's the only way that your hopes and desires are really going to be fulfilled. And that's the one I came to accomplish. A couple weeks ago, we looked at the passage before this, how there's this blind man, and we, talk, show, we talked about this unusual healing of Jesus, how Jesus touches the blind man twice, and it's almost like Jesus misses on the first time and it's like what is going on here why does he have to touch the blind man twice for the man to see but we noted that this is actually in the center of the book right at this point because this blind man and this healing is a parable for Jesus' relationship with the disciples that they are blind and they only see Jesus in part they don't see him in full but here's what you need to understand Peter's blindness it didn't just it didn't just have to do with seeing Jesus it also had to do with seeing himself And oftentimes, that's what, same with us. You, you cannot understand God unless you understand yourself. You cannot fully comprehend who God is and what he has done for you until you actually go in and go deep and fully understand yourself. This is why taking emotional inventory It's not psychobabble and mumbo jumbo. It's understanding the deep problems within us and what Jesus has to come and heal and rescue. See, some of us, we're a heady crowd. Some of us, we know the doctrine. And we think because we know the doctrine, we know Jesus, we know God. But here's the only problem. We're not self-aware. And if we're not self-aware, we really don't know God. 
We know a veneer, but we don't know him fully. And to understand who he is fully and what he fully has done for you and the links that he went to save you and what he is doing for your life, you actually have to go in. Peter needs to go in and see how badly he needs to be rescued. See, the cross is a revelation. It reveals who we are. And it reveals that we are bad enough that someone had to die for us. That nothing less than the precious blood of the Son of God would rescue us. Do we understand that? See, I'm not sure that we do. I think most of the time what we think that we need is reformation. Self-help, self-improvement. That's what most people believe that we need, Christians included. And that's why there are all these kind of 30-day challenges out there. And 60-day challenges. And if we just do these challenges, then we can improve ourselves. And by self-improvement, then we can come into who we really need to be. But you understand, you have to understand that... What this is saying is this, you don't need reformation, you need a resurrection. You actually have to go through death. There has to be a a tragic, traumatic rupture in life. And you have to be raised again. See, it's not a little reform on the outside. It is to be killed and to be made alive by the miraculous agency of God. That is what you and I need. And nothing less than the death and resurrection of the Son of God and us going through that with him will bring it about. That's why Lent, this period, in Lent people don't fast, at least they shouldn't. They don't fast because we want to rid ourselves of some vices and we think that by doing this, by setting aside this period, we can do our 40-day challenge. And rid ourselves of some vices to get better. That's not what it's about. We fast to remind ourselves that we need nothing less than death and resurrection. And it took nothing less than death and resurrection to bring that about. We fast because when we get hungry or when we put off, we reminded ourselves that actually, like, we're twisted. And, well... It's not just about putting up a wall here and improving a wall there. No, the foundations have to be ripped off. And we've got to rebuild. It's got to happen over again. See, the cross reveals to us that Jesus is the one who must suffer and die because we are so bad that it requires nothing less than the death and resurrection of the Son of God to release us from sin and Satan. But the cross reveals something else as well. It reveals not only that we are so bad that Jesus had to die for us, but that we are so loved that he was willing to die for us. Notice in verse 33 how Jesus responds to Peter. He says, get behind me, Satan. You thought you'd been called some names. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Get behind me, Satan. I mean, those are strong words. You usually, I mean, I don't know about you, but usually calling someone else, you know, you call someone a lot of things, but you're usually not going to say they're like demonic or satanic unless uh, that's a huge, that's a very strong reaction. And from Jesus. What's going on here? What would possess him? What would cause him? What would motivate him to have such a strong reaction to Peter? Well, the text tells us. Look in verse 33. Again, look at the beginning of it. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter. What caused Jesus to say, get behind me, Satan? It was his love of them. The community that he came to rescue. See, because Jesus knew that the only way that he could be with them forever 
as if he went to the cross. And anything that was going to try to thwart that plan, he said, get behind me, Satan. I will stop at nothing to get the bride who I came to get. And there is no price that is too great. And if anything gets in my way, watch out. Turning and seeing his disciples. And turning and seeing through his disciples, you and me. He said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. There was a movie, B-rate movie, in 2006 that provides a good illustration and had a great actor, Denzel Washington. I mean, who doesn't like Denzel? Denzel is amazing. And it's called Man on Fire. Man on Fire is about John Creasy, a former CIA operative who is kind of washed up and burned out, but he's been brought to Mexico to be a bodyguard for a very um, influential person's daughter. And Creasy kind of takes the job reluctantly. He doesn't have money. He needs it. Uh, but it's a time when in Mexico, within the last uh, six days, there had been something like 250 abduct child abductions. So he's there to watch after this girl. And she starts like up a relationship with him, but he's kind of hard and, and, uh, and doesn't really want a relationship. But, but eventually, you know, kids have a way of doing this. She kind of, she wins his heart. And he develops this deep, deep love for her. And, uh, and then there's a scene in the movie. And um, if you haven't seen it by now, 10 years. So no spoiler alert. I'm just going for it. Um, so she, uh, she, gets, she gets kidnapped. So otherwise we wouldn't have a movie. So you should have saw that coming. <laughs> right? If you didn't see that coming, we, got, we can talk. Um, uh, so, the, uh, so at that point... Uh, he has this deep love for her, and he, he's going to go after these people. And like, well, Denzel, he becomes Denzel. So at that point, he says, it, you know, someone asks him, what are you going to do? And he goes, anyone that was involved, anybody who profited from it, anyone who opens their eyes at me. You know, that's the point. You're like, yeah. He goes, I'm going to kill him, right? I don't, I don't recommend that. Um, <laughs> But it's part of the movie, right? But the point is, is that whatever is in his way, he will go to no end to rescue this little girl. And in fact, in the end of the movie, he gives his own life as a ransom for hers to release her. And you watch that movie, and it's kind of cheesy and sentimental and all that stuff, but you still like, I still like it, and I like it for more than the fact that Denzel Washington's in it, and I could just watch him for hours on end. I like it because, let's be honest, deep down, I want to be loved like that. I want to be pursued like that. I want to know that I'm so valuable to somebody that if I get in trouble, they will stop at no end to protect me and preserve me and help me and care for me. And you do too. I want you to know that Jesus is a man on fire. And that he loves you. And that his love will pay the highest price for you. And he will stop at no end. He will move heaven and earth to get you. He will go to hell and back. The Son of Man must suffer. Be killed and rise again. And he will do it all for you. That's who Jesus is. That's how much you are loved. Just receive it. Accept it. Believe it. Confess that he is it, the Christ who had to die and rise again for your salvation. And know the lover of your soul and the one who satisfies. Amen.